you can present uh, yourself and uh, your lecture. Hartley, welcome. <laughs> yeah. This one is for TV. Hello, og tak for invitasjonen. <laughs> I wish I could continue, but I, I wrote some words out in Norwegian that I did on Google Translate, but I couldn't even figure out, even though I have it written down, I have no idea how to pronounce it. So, excuse me, I wish I could uh, do more than that. Um, First of all, thank you, thank you very much uh, for inviting me and my wife uh, to be in Norway. This is our first time, and it's uh, it, it's a pleasure it's a pleasure to be here. What I'm going to be trying to do now for the um, first of all, I'll try to talk slow so that the translation uh, picks up. Um, what I'm going to try to do over the next or the, the two lectures that I'm going to be giving to you is to kind of brief you on the current political and domestic situation in Israel. Amid the crisis right now with the U.S., in the midst of, of President Obama's uh, uh, beginning and kind of stalled diplomatic push, as Iran marches towards, towards nuclear uh, development, towards becoming a nuclear power, as things start to heat up again in the north, we're hearing all kinds of uh, 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 echoes of, uh, or uh, concerns about a possible uh, conflagration, a possible situation, a violent situation in the north. As things in the south are always kind of a bit testy, as you hear from Noam Bedin, what's going on in Sterot, right? That's a lot. That, that, that's a lot to talk about. There's always quite a bit happening on the ground in Israel, as you all know, since you follow the news here, uh, uh, quite a bit, I imagine. I live, I live outside of Jerusalem in a place called Malia Dumim. Malia Dumim is, uh, is the biggest uh, Jewish community outside or in the West Bank, outside of the Green Line. And uh, we had a guest speaker it's about 20 minutes outside of Jerusalem, and we had a guest speaker in my synagogue in 2005, right before the disengagement from Gaza. You all remember the disengagement from Gaza. This was a very traumatic, uh, traumatic event in Israeli history. Uh, and we had a guest speaker who came to my synagogue on, on a Shabbat, on a Sabbath afternoon. And he said that people were driving him nuts, asking him what will be. My year, what's going to be? What's going to happen in Gaza? What's going to happen when Israel leaves Gaza? What's going to happen when the, when, the, when the rockets start falling after we leave from Gaza? What's going to be with the settlers? What's going to be with the terrorists? Where's it all going? So he said this one man was driving him crazy all the time, asking him what's going to be, what's going to be, what's going to be my year. He said he took the guy to the side and he said, look, we're Jews. As Jews, we believe in the end, everything will work out, right? We're optimistic people. In the end, there'll be peace. In the end, there'll be shalom. In the end, everything will be great. In the end, there'll be redemption. Your problem, he said to the man, is you were born in the middle. And I think to a large degree that does kind of sum up our situation. We are we're very, very much in the middle. We're in the middle of transformative events that are transforming the region, that are transforming the society. And what I want to do tonight to, to, to begin with is, is, first of all, to touch on the, on the transformations that we've seen inside Israeli society. Because I think that it's important when you look at what Israel's doing, when you look at certain acts that the government does, everything from setting up roadblocks to building a security fence to going to war in, in, in Gaza or in Lebanon, you have to understand what's going through the Israeli mind. What is the Israeli psychology? Why is this happening? And I think what we've seen is we've seen a great transformation of Israel over, over the last 10 years. Since the beginning of what's known as the Second Intifada in, in 2000, right, the second wave of, 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 of Palestinian organized terrorism, Israel, Israeli society has undergone a fundamental transformation. A transformation best evident, by the way, in the fact that Netanyahu, that Bibi Netanyahu won the elections in February 2009 with a right wing, with the right wing government. And to understand that victory, to understand how it is that Bibi Netanyahu won that election, it's important to understand the major preoccupation that Israelis have with one thing, and that's, that's personal security. 
And again, I'm going to be talking about what I believe is a transformation that Israel has undergone, a huge transformation from the beginning of the Oslo process in 1992, 1993, to where we are today. The country has gone through an incredible transformation. And I think one figure that, 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 that illustrates that the best is the fact that in, in, in the elections of 1992, am I speaking too fast? Is this uh, being picked up in the translation? It's okay? Okay. Um, in the elections of 1992, when, when Yitzhak Rabin beat Yitzhak Shamir, the two major left-wing parties at the time, the two mainstream Zionistic left-wing parties, Meretz and Labor, together won 56 seats in the Knesset, right? 56 out of 120 seats. That's a lot. That's nearly half the Knesset. In the last elections in February 2009, those same two parties together won 16 seats, right? That's an incredible drop. That's a huge drop. But what happened? Has Israelis, have the Israelis stopped yearning for peace? You know, why did these two parties go from 56 seats to 16 seats? What happened? And I think it's, what happened is very simple. I think Israelis, to a large extent, have been mugged, mugged by reality. A good, true understanding of Israel begins and ends with an understanding of what it is like to feel insecure to feel that a rocket could pound into your apartment or a bomb could explode on your bus or harm could come to your kid in the army. The last bit about harm coming to your kid in the army is something my wife and I felt intensely last January. Our son was, uh, was in, in, is in the paratroopers uh, and he was in, in, in the Gaza war last January. And what we went through during that period, during those three weeks that he was in Gaza and we didn't hear from him, it is something that is apparent. I've never felt anything like that in my life. It was the most difficult thing that I think my wife and I have ever gone through as a parent. And believe me, that type of experience, an experience that it wasn't unique to my wife and I, but was a, an experience that was, was shared by thousands of other Israelis, that type of experience shapes what you think the government should be doing and what risks you think the government should be taking because you are very, 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 very much involved in it. So to understand Israel today, to understand the furious reaction to the Goldstone report about the, about the Gaza war, to understand the building of the security fence, to understand the roadblocks in the West Bank, to understand so much of what you see on the television that looks so harsh, you have to understand the strain and the pressure that everybody has been living with in Israel from September, or everybody lived with in Israel from September 2000 to about... 2005, 2006, that, that, that period of intense, intense terrorism, right? This is a critical subtext in, in understanding the Israeli reality, and unfortunately, it's a subtext or a part of the story that definitely doesn't come out well enough abroad in places, in places like Norway. The Palestinian violence that began in September 2000, like I said, fundamentally changed and altered Israeli society. The nation that to a large extent embraced the Oslo process as the beginning of a new dawn in 1993 is now very, very wary of any diplomatic process or the new diplomatic process that we're seeing uh, being started now by, by President Obama. Something happened, and that something has a name, and the name is simply terrorism. In a small country like Israel where people feel subjectively in their guts and what's known as Yiddish is the Kishkas has a huge impact on policy. And what the Israelis have felt in their guts since September 2000 is intense insecurity and vulnerability. And much of what the government has done since then must be seen within the context of trying to alleviate the sense of insecurity and vulnerability. Now, policy decisions oftentimes flow from the, from the top down, right? A government makes a decision, the government the spokesmen come out and say, this is what the country should be doing, and then the country then comes along and accepts that position. This is what essentially happened when Ariel Sharon said he was going to leave Gaza, right? The country didn't know where this was coming from. Ariel Sharon wakes up one morning and says Israel needs to leave Gaza. Because of the force of his personality, because of his history, because of who he was, the country ultimately adopted that policy. But policy also flows from the bottom up. It starts with the people and it moves its way up to the governmental levels. And we saw this very much indeed in 2002. 2002 was the height of the terrorism, right? 455 Israelis were killed in one year, which is a lot of people compared to last year when only five Israelis, thank God, were killed by terrorism. 
At that time, the people stood up and said, you have to do something for to, to protect us, right? You have to do something to protect us. So then Ariel Sharon, who was opposed, who was opposed to building the security fence, right? What's, what's called over here the wall or the separation wall, he had to build that fence because the people demanded, demanded that the government do something to protect them. So again, this just shows you how what people feel subjectively themselves has a huge impact in Israel on governmental policy. Now the experts will look at the situation in, around the world and in Israel, and they'll, they'll explain it like this. They'll say, look, Israel isn't the only country in the world facing threats, right? There are other countries around the world that face threats. Some countries, like Spain, for instance, uh, uh, face threats from, from inside the border. Spain has it with the Basques. The Russians have it with the Chechens. These are countries that are facing internal, internal threats. Others face a threat from, uh, from their neighbors along the borders. Right? The best example of a long, simmering border dispute is India and Pakistan. Right? They have problems on their borders. Other countries face threats from, from a long way away, from long-range ballistic missiles. Right? The U.S. and Russia, you know, they both kind of eyeball each other nervously because of what they could do to each other with the long-range ballistic missiles. What's unique about Israel, right, and what gives new meaning to the idea of a special people or a chosen people, we face all three threats simultaneously. We face threats from inside the country, we face threats from immediately along the borders, and we face threats from long-range ballistic missiles. And that is a situation that is unique, that is unique in the world. You have suicide bombers trying to slip in over the fence. You have Qassam rockets coming through the windows. You have Katusha rockets landing on the roofs. You have Hezbollah in the north trying to get in through the back door. And you have the Iranian president waking up every other day and threatening to blow up the entire house. Right? That's the mindset. That's the reality that Israelis wake up to every day. And to understand the government's policies, it's crucial, it's critical to understand that mindset and to understand that psychology. I've lived, I've lived in Israel now for, for 27 years. <clears throat> I'm originally from the States. I moved there right after college from Denver, Colorado. I lived through the first Lebanon War and the second Lebanon War, the first Gulf War and the second Gulf War, the first Intifada and the second Intifada. And believe me, the period from 2000 to 2005, the period of this intense terrorism, was the most trying, the most difficult period I ever experienced in Israel. It used to be the way it works in Israel is that everybody goes into the reserves, right? Everybody does reserve duty. I did 15 years in the reserves. I was a combat medic. Uh, they used to send me to the northern borders. I used to always go to the north for about a month out of the year. Um, they'd send me to the Lebanese border. They'd send me to the Syrian border. And the way it works in Israel is, you know, you get your call-up notice, and you have to get your, they, they send you a, a notice to home in the mail that you're going to be called up, and you have, you know, a month to get your, 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 your everything in order. You don't have to get your life in order. You have to tell your work that you're not going to be there for, for, for a month. And I'd get these notices, and I'd get nervous. I'd be nervous for myself, right? Because, you know, they send me to the northern borders. Things happen on the borders, right? Terrorists infiltrate through borders. Rockets fall on borders. I'd get nervous. Uh, I come from Denver, Colorado. I don't come from a great military background. Uh, my, father, uh, my father, God bless him, used to say he was a uh, clerk typist in the American Army during the Korean War. He used to say that when the enemy came, he backspaced. Okay, so that was kind of my, that was where I was coming from psychologically about how I looked at the military. It's not something that I was, I was that, that accustomed to, that ready for. So I'd get this call-up notice in the mail, and I'd get nervous for my own security. The last time I was in Milouim in reserves was in, uh, was in uh, March of 2002. March of 2002 was the absolute worst month of terrorism Israel ever faced. 135 people were killed that month. This was the, the month of the, uh, the uh, Passover night massacre in Netanya. And I remember during that month, I, I've since been drummed out. That was my last reserve duty I've ever had to do. I was drummed out because of old age. But that month, I was on the Golan Heights, right? I was on the Syrian border. And I felt secure. I felt safe. I was hunkered down in a bunker. I had on a, a flak jacket. I had on a helmet. I had a rifle. I felt secure. I was worried about my 13-year-old daughter at the time who had to take the bus from where I live in Maludamim into Jerusalem. And that's how the whole psychology of security has changed, was flipped on its head because of, because of, the, uh, because of the terrorism. In this environment, and this is something I, I, I don't think that people appreciate enough abroad, 
In this type of environment, it's a real challenge to raise kids. It's a real challenge to raise kids. I'll give you my own personal example. I have four children, thank God. My oldest right now is in the paratroopers. Uh, please God, he's going, to be, he's going to be getting out of the Army in about three weeks. His entire adolescent life, from the time he was 13, was lived under the shadow of terrorism. Now, I don't want to give you the impression that everything was dark and everything was gloomy and everything was bad, because it wasn't, right? I mean, the kid did have a good adolescent life, but still, there was this cloud of terrorism that kind of colored and shaded everything. Uh, I remember as a kid growing up in, in, in the U.S., the main formative political event of the time was Watergate, right? And that kind of shaped me the way I look at politics, the reason I went into journalism, it shaped me. The main formative thing that was the, the colored my son's adolescence, right, was was the terrorism, uh, and it was difficult as a parent because he was, you know, he was an adolescent, and he wanted to go. He wanted to be with his friends. He wanted to go to Tel Aviv. He wanted to take the bus. He wanted to go to the beach, you know. And he asked you, "Can I go?" And you'd say, "No, no, no, no. You can't go," until at a certain point in time, you couldn't say no anymore because he's driving you nuts. So you let him go. But you let him go with kind of a sick feeling in the pit of your stomach. Are you, as a parent, doing the right and responsible thing, letting him, letting him go? Uh, and again, I think this, 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 this terrorism, it shaped, it shaped his politics. It shaped what he wanted to do in the Army. Right? I wanted my son to be a cook in the Army. He wanted to be a commando. I think one of the reasons for this was because of the, the sense of helplessness he had, you know, living under this, under this, 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 this scourge of, of terrorism. And again, it shaped his politics. It shaped his politics. My daughter, my daughter now is, uh, she's uh, 19 years old, and she's doing what's called national service in, in a city in the north in Israel. I remember when she was about 13 or 14, she came up to, to my wife and I, and she said, Abba, you know, Dad, I'm afraid to get on the bus, right? And this was now, thank God, there's nothing to be afraid about to getting on buses in Israel. But back then there was. And you hear this, and as a parent, it kills you. You know, it, it kills you to hear your kids say this. Because she has to get on the bus, right? Uh, you can't say, well, no, honey, don't worry, nothing will happen. Because back then, things were happening. But at the same time, she had to get on the bus. So again, I'm just saying this to give you an indication of how the terrorism and the tension seeped into, seeped into everybody's lives. During the worst of the, of the violence, we would try to insulate the kids. You know, you, you want to you wanna protect your kids as much as you can, not only protect them physically, but protect them from images and thoughts and ideas that you don't want always to be tormenting their mind. I'm a newspaper man, and I get, I get, I get three, four newspapers delivered to my, day, to my door each day. And I remember during the height of the Intifada when buses were blowing up every other day or every other week, right, I would make sure I would go out to get the papers before my kids saw them because I didn't need those pictures of, 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 of charred auto buses uh, etched into their minds. I didn't need those images of people screaming and crying etched into my kids' minds. So you try to insulate the kids, right? You try, but it's, it's very difficult because the violence and the terrorism were everywhere. And believe me, in this environment, and this is something that people also don't necessarily comprehend who don't live there, in this environment, it's extremely tough to raise kids who don't hate, who simply don't hate, because they are surrounded by it. And it's real, and it's immediate, and it's not something that's happening elsewhere. Right? And they're kids. They're kids who see things in black and white shades. Right? They're adolescents. They don't see the gray areas. My kids would come home sometimes and say things around the, around the dinner table that I could not believe were coming out of the mouths of my children. Right? I come from a, a liberal Jewish family in Denver, Colorado, and they would say things that, that shocked me, that shocked me. And I would try to counter it with the same things that my mother would say to me as a kid. You know, you can't generalize. You can't blame everybody. Not all Palestinians want to throw you into the ocean. Not all Arabs want to kill you. But when you're dealing with adolescents who, again, see things in black and white shades, this is a hard sell. It's a hard sell. So as, as parents, right, my wife, myself, many other parents in, in Israel, you spend a lot of your parental energy, a lot of your emotional energy, trying to keep your kids from being either consumed by fear or by hatred. And it's a tough sell. It's a difficult chore, and it's a difficult chore made all the more difficult by the fact that the terrorism was real. It was excruciatingly real. It was incredibly real. It wasn't something happening that you saw on television. It wasn't something happening beyond the water's edge. It was happening to people you knew. It was happening to your neighborhood. It was immediate, and it was real. And again, I'll give you my own very personal example. I live in a, in a very average apartment building in Milo Domingue. There are 12 
12 units in my apartment. Right? There's nothing, nothing special, nothing unique about it. The person we bought our apartment from was killed in a terrorist attack. Our former cleaning, cleaning woman, a, a Russian immigrant, was killed in a terrorist attack. My upstairs neighbor's first cousin was a soldier in Hebron. He was killed in Hebron uh, on a mission there. My next door neighbor's uh, cousin, a junior high school kid, was hurt badly in a, in a suicide bombing attack in Perach Tikva. A co-worker of mine at the Jerusalem Post on his way to work was hurt badly in a suicide bomb in Jerusalem. Right? The terrorism was everywhere. It crept into everything, and it shaped how people look, looked and continue to look at the world today. This is a trauma that Israel has not yet come out of. And I think, again, to understand Israel today, you have to understand, you have to understand that trauma. It's important to understand and not to underestimate the country's sense of vulnerability, right? The, 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 the vulnerability, this, 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 this concern for security that came about as a result of this, this very traumatic experience and how important that is now in dictating policy today, policy now towards the, towards the Iranians, towards the Syrians, and of course, towards the Palestinians. Now, what I want to touch briefly upon right now is, is policy to each of those circles, and I want to start from the outside in, from, from Iran and moving into the Palestinians. When, 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 when strategists in Jerusalem look at the country's threats, when they grade the country's existential threats and try to figure out who is the biggest threat to Israel, they generally start outward with Iran, then move to Syria, and paradoxically, only then to the Palestinians, right? The Palestinian problem is a serious problem. It's a constant thorn in our side. It's a massive, massive headache, right? But it is not an existential threat, right? Israel is not going to cease to exist because of Palestinian terrorism. Iran, however, is a completely, a completely different situation. For roughly the last decade, since Israel has been concerned about Iran's nuclear ambitions, its policies on Iran has been guided by the following premise. Iranian nuclear arms are not only an Israeli problem, which needs an Israeli solution, but rather an international problem that needs an international solution. Right? And while very active diplomatically in trying to stop Iran, Israel did not necessarily for years jump out and take the lead in this issue. Right? You didn't hear the Israeli prime minister come out, and he wasn't in the front of the world in trying to get the world to stop to stop the Iranian threat. Ahmadinejad was keen, was very keen in framing this issue. The Iranian president was very keen in framing this issue as an Iranian-Israeli issue. He was, he was interested in framing it as a Jewish-Muslim problem in order to get other Arabs off his back, right? If this could be framed, if he could frame this as Islam against Jews, as, as Iran against Israel, then other countries, other so-called moderate Arab countries in the region, like the Saudis or the Kuwaitis, who are actually more afraid of a potential Iranian bomb than Israel because they don't have any way to, 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 to protect themselves against it, right? They would stay, they would stay quiet, right? If he could say that this was an Iranian Israeli issue, they weren't going to stand up and come out against, against the Iranian nuclear problem. And I think it's, 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 it's essential in understanding this. Only then can we realize right, why the Iranian president has made Holocaust denial such a big part of his persona. Right? Why does he do this? Because he wants to turn this into something that is Jew against Muslim, Iran against Israel. Israel tried you know, not to take the lead in dealing with the issue because it didn't want to play into his hands on this matter. Publicly, Israel is still kind of sitting back and waiting to see what the world will do not feeling quite yet that the time has come for unilateral military action and thinking that maybe, just maybe, the world through its diplomatic or its sanctions, right, economic action can actually stop Tehran. The feeling in Jerusalem right now, and opinion Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has articulated on many, many occasions, is that sanctions could actually work if they're crippling, if they go after Iran's energy sector. The sanctions being discussed now at the United Nations fall very short of that, right? But there's still hope that the U.S., after it gets their sanctions pushed through the U.N., which will be a symbolic victory, the U.S. will then take more stringent sanctions against the Iranians. And the Israeli opinion, or the opinion that you hear in the halls of power in Jerusalem, is that if the world is really behind this, or if the developed world, if the U.S., if Europe, if Japan, right, if these countries bind together, then these sanctions could actually have, 
have some, have some, have some impact. Right? Iran is not North Korea. Iran doesn't want to be completely isolated from the world. Israel has said, and I believe it means it, at the same time, that it cannot tolerate a nuclear Iran. What that means is that if push comes to shove, it might have to, at a certain point in time, take military action. And if it does so, if it does take military action, it most, it most desperately needs U.S. support, which explains Israel's policies right now towards Washington and how it's trying to deal with Iran. When President Barack Obama came into office and said that he wanted to engage the Iranians diplomatically, the Israelis, extremely skeptical that this would work, said, anyhow, go ahead and try. Right? Let's see what happens. The same regarding the latest round of UN sanctions and the US request to give the sanctions some time. Israel doesn't believe that the UN sanctions alone is going to do much, right? but it still said, go ahead, try anyway. Why? Why is this the Israeli position? Not because they think this can work, but I think because of a belief that if it fails, and a belief that it will fail, then, and, they, and then if, if it does fail and they have to take action, then they can come to the U.S. with clean hands, right, with clean hands and say, look, we gave you as much time as you needed. We gave you the chance and nothing worked. Now there might not be any other alternative than military action. The strategy right now in Jerusalem is to get the U.S. to live with, to live with the idea of a possible military strike. That's the overall strategy. And the tactic is to first let Washington exhaust its efforts towards the Iranians before Israel might have to step in and do something. But is it realistic, you might ask yourself, to think that Israel might indeed take military action? That's a tough question to answer. All we have to go on is past history, right? That's, we can only look at what's happened in the past. And I'm not only talking about Israel's attack on Iraq in 1981. If you look at in recent Israeli history, when Israel feels vulnerable, it acts. It felt vulnerable by, by Palestinian terrorism, right? It reached a peak in 2002, and it acted. It acted against Palestinian terrorism, showing that there just might be a military solution to terrorism, despite all the talk at the time that this was impossible, that you can't militarily defeat terrorists. When it felt vulnerable in the summer of 2006 by a wave of kidnappings, right? We had, we had uh, Gilad Shalit was kidnapped in the south. Two soldiers were kidnapped in the north north of Jerusalem, this is all in a, in, in a span of a few weeks, north of Jerusalem, an Israeli uh, high school kid was kidnapped and killed, right? There was a sense that we were on the, on the cusp, on the wave of a new horrible type of terrorism. Israel felt vulnerable and it took action, right? It went into Lebanon to stop this thing. When it felt vulnerable, when it felt vulnerable by something that was being built in Syria, a nuclear installation being built in Syria in 2007, right? It took action to stop that because it felt that its back was being pushed against a wall. In Gaza, right? Israel absorbed, absorbed thousands of, of Qassam rockets from Gaza until it came to a point that it just couldn't take it anymore. So it went in very strongly into Gaza. It felt vulnerable, so it acted. When the country feels vulnerable, it acts. And the message coming out of Jerusalem is that Iran's insufficiently impeded nuclear march is making it feel vulnerable. The problem, however, as we all realize, is that Iran today is not Iraq of 1981. If Israel hits Iran, Iran will hit back. Israel hit Iraq and they didn't have the capacity to anything. Iran is very much building up its capacity to hit us. And it's dealing with, with how to protect us from their counter blows, right? Not conventional warfare as in the past, but missiles that are going to fly into our most populated cities. Dealing with it, that is the, the, that is the main thing that the country now is trying to deal with. Two days ago, you had a huge drill in Israel. You had a huge drill for the home front, right? There were sirens all across the country. Everybody was supposed to go find their protected room where they're supposed to go and, uh, and, 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 and find shelter in case of a missile attack. Israel is taking this, this possibility extremely, extremely seriously, partly because if they do have to hit Iran, then there's, everybody realizes that Iran is going to hit back and we have to protect ourselves. Also, for this reason, the bulk of Israel's defense development budget and the best of its technological minds have gone into trying to build over the last number of years a three-tiered anti-missile system that will protect us not only against short-range missiles, short-range Qassam missiles coming from Gaza, not only from Katusha rockets coming from Hezbollah in Lebanon, but more importantly, would be able to protect us 
to a large degree. You're not going to be able to hermetically seal the skies. But if you get this three-tiered nuclear, uh, three-tiered anti-missile umbrella up, you can reduce to a great deal the casualties that the country would perhaps have to suffer if indeed it hit Iran and Iran decided to use Hamas and Hezbollah to lob, uh, to lob missiles on Israel. Will Israel attack Iran? I don't know. I don't completely rule it out. When? When it feels that it has an adequate missile umbrella in place so that if we hit them and they hit us back, we will be able to, to somehow protect ourselves to the best to the best of our abilities. Now this brings me just very, very briefly to, to Syria. Regarding Syria, let, let me just say just let me just say a couple a couple of quick things. First of all, every once in a while, kind of like the ice cream flavor of the month, someone talks about restarting the diplomatic channel with Syria. Right? We're hearing that right now. Everybody's talking all of a sudden, out of nowhere. Maybe it's time to, to restart something with the Syrians. My own personal opinion on this is to forget about it. It's not serious for a number of reasons. The primary one being that Iran right now is not going to let Syria make any peace overtures towards Israel. Right? Things are not what they were a decade ago. Syria's dependability or Syria's, the degree to which Syria depends on Iran for all kinds of things, from military hardware to, 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 military hardware to economic support to oil, right? it has put them very much into the Iranian orbit. And it's very difficult for me to believe that Syria w will be able to get out of the, of the Iranian orbit, even if it wanted to. I was talking once to a, uh, not too long ago, to uh, somebody in the foreign ministry. And they said that thinking that I, Syria could break away from Iran right now is compatible to thinking that the, 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 che the Czechoslovakia could have broken away from the Soviet Union in 1968. Right? That's the degree to which they are, they are so, so very linked. Plus, there is a, a serious, what we call uh, in Americanese, that there's a serious disconnect between Syrians' words and Syria's actions. Right? It's one thing for, for, uh, for uh, Syrian President Bashar Assad to stand up and say that, you know, if Israel gives up the Golan Heights, then there'll be peace. Right? But those words are not, are not accompanied by any deeds. At the same time that he's making these types of statements, he continues to house every Palestinian terrorist headquarter in Damascus. Right? These are not necessarily the acts of a man who's interested in peace. While he's making these statements, he's continuing to let Iranian arms flood into Syria, right? Into Hezbollah in Syria. He's uh, letting those arms go to Hamas. So those aren't necessarily the, the acts of somebody who is indeed, indeed interested in peace. So I think that when you hear about these, these words coming at us again, as they always do, what Syria does by trying to talk about peace they're more interested not necessarily in peace with Israel. What they're interested to is relieving their isolation in the world. And to a large extent, they've been able to do that. If you look at where Syria is today compared to where it was in 2006, 2005, they have broken out of their isolation. They've broken out of their isolation to a large extent because of certain words that Assad has made regarding the peace process. Now this brings me, this brings me to the Palestinians. I'll be speaking at, at, at more length or greater length about this on, on Sunday, about the diplomatic process now with the Palestinians, the whole Mitchell process, and the interplay between us, between the Palestinians, between the Obama administration. But allow me here just to make some preliminary observations. And they go back what I, to what I said earlier about Israel's preoccupation with security. First of all, the conception in Israel that we had in the 80s, and especially in the 90s around the time of the Oslo process, was that if we merely make the necessary concessions, we could ensure our future in the region. If we just give, we're going to get peace back in return. That idea has to a large extent gone by the wayside because of the terrorism. Right? The country went over the last 15 years from believing that it could solve the conflict to believing that all we could do, at least for the short term, or until attitudes fundamentally change on the other side, and they actually accept us, they actually accept our right to be in that area as a Jewish state, right? all we can do, we can't solve the conflict, all we can do is manage it. We went from believing in conflict resolution to conflict management, and that's a big difference. Right? That's a big difference. And I think one of them, and this I'll get into on Sunday, but I think one of the major reasons we have problems right now with the Obama administration is they still believe that you can solve the conflict, resolve the conflict once and for all. And we're thinking right now that the best we can do for the short term is to manage the conflict. And then Israel went through different ideas 
of how best to manage the conflict. Ariel Sharon's way of managing the overall conflict was what has become known as unilateralism, right? Do what's good for you, get out of the Palestinians' lives, get out of their face, right? Hunker down on the other side of a security border, of a security fence, and everything will be all right, right? That was Sharon's overarching idea. But things didn't go as they never do in the Middle East. They didn't go quite as planned. Israel left Gaza to the very last Jew, but that wasn't enough. Hamas came to power, Qassam rockets continued to fall, and an Israeli soldier, Gilad Shalit, was kidnapped. Now this all hammered home to many in Israel the conclusion that unilateralism is simply too easy. That you can't just turn your backs and leave because everything here, in the, in, everything in Israel is just too close, right? If you're sitting in this room and there's a fire out there in the foyer, you're going to inhale the smoke. And I think a feeling that most Israelis have is that we've inhaled quite a bit of smoke since Gaza, since we left Gaza in 2000, 2005. So now Israeli society is to a large degree in a state of flux. It tried to negotiate a settlement, that was the Oslo process, but that didn't work. It tried to unilaterally give up land, right? We left Lebanon unilaterally in 2000. We withdrew from Lebanon completely. That didn't work. We left Gaza. Right? We unilaterally disengaged from Gaza in 2005, and that failed. And I think this has driven home to many of us a, a belief or a feeling that the dilemma we face is indeed a very cruel one. On the one hand, there's a feeling among the majority of the country that the continued retention, if only indirectly, of the territories and all the Palestinians who live there, this is something that in the long term is bad for the country's national security. This isn't sustainable over time. However, I think there's also a realization among most that just picking up and leaving, as was done in Gaza, is bad for the average Israeli's personal security, and that no one but Dean will be able to tell you when he speaks to you on Sunday. The dilemma can be summed up as follows. How do you leave a good chunk of the territories and stay alive? How do you leave a good chunk of the territories and stay alive? And nobody really has come up with the formula, a good formula, about how exactly this can be done. That is the country's overarching dilemma. And it's into this breach, it's, it's how to deal with this dilemma, that now you have the new players who've sailed into the breach. Netanyahu, Barack Obama, and the Palestinian president, Mahmoud Abbas. And that's what, how their position on this, their, each of their attitudes toward this is what, what, what I hope to discuss at more depth with you on Sunday. Now when you hear everything I just said, you can kind of be excused for thinking, my gosh, that sounds kind of depressing, right? That doesn't sound like great news. That's very pessimistic. And when you're deep inside it, as we are when we live in Israel, it kind of feels that way at times, right? But I'm optimistic. I'm optimistic about the future of Israel's existence. I'm optimistic about the future of Israeli society. I'm not necessarily optimistic about our ability to reach any kind of final agreement with the Palestinians. I'm a little bit more optimistic about, about our ability to deal with the Iranian situation, but I am optimistic, and you know, you sometimes in the, in, in the newspapers or in, in magazines, I know Time Magazine, will Israel exist you know, in the future? I'm optimistic about the country's ability to weather all these storms. And I'm optimistic about this for two main reasons. And these are actually also the two reasons that I enjoy the most about living in the country. One is the country's amazing resilience, and the other is the country's uncanny ability to solve short-term problems, to cope with problems that are thrown at it from all, all various directions. Now, regarding the resilience, all you had to do to sense the resilience of Israeli society was to walk the streets of the country from 2000 to 2005, this period of, of mind-bending terrorism, walk the streets and see that despite it all, the people still carried on their lives with an incredible degree of creativity and vibrancy and vitality, right? In spite of the fact that taking your family downtown into Jerusalem to get a falafel was something that you had a debate about, you know, in your mind whether or not this was a, a, a smart thing to do. You saw this resilience and it was an uplifting, life-affirming resilience that made one proud to actually be a part of. There was a, there was a merits uh, a Knesset member from the left-wing Merits Party, who during the worst period of, this, of the Intifada, I think it was in 2000 and 2003, he wrote something that I'll always remember. He said, you have a unique situation right now in Israel. You have the worst terrorism anybody has ever faced. 
you have extremely difficult military duty for much of the country in the Palestinian territories, right? We marched back into Janine. That was not an easy thing to do, right? The gates are wide open, and the people are not running for the exits. And I think that's something that, again, that demonstrates the country's incredible resilience. The people are much more committed to the country than we, the Israelis, give ourselves credit for, or I think that the other side uh, uh, gives us, uh, appreciates, right? Much more committed to the country than, than we actually think. As to, as to the second element that gives me my optimism, uh, uh, the country's ability to solve short-term problems, Israel is great at dealing with short-term problems. We're not so hot at dealing with long-term problems, but it's short-term problems. If there's a problem, the country doesn't sit around and hang its head and say we can't deal with it. It finds, it finds a solution. The best, the best illustration of this recently was the ability of the country to get a hold of the terrorism, to bring down the terrorism. Again, you have to look at the numbers. Like I said, in 2002, 454 Israelis were killed by terrorism. Last year, five Israelis were killed by terrorism. That's an incredible drop. And that's not something that just happened. It's not as if the Palestinians stopped trying to blow us up. It's just we became that much more adept at defending ourselves, right? We found short-term solutions for this. Solutions were, there were a number of different solutions, right? There's the building of the security fence, technological solutions, sending the, the military back into the Palestinian cities. But we found a short-term solution to this problem. You know, we're going to hear about the Qassam rockets coming into interstellar from Gaza. I think that technologically Israel is going to be able to find a solution to that too. The problem is that once we find a solution, they're going to find something else that they're going to do to make our lives miserable. And then you go on and on and on and on. But we do have the ability to find solutions to problems. I read something humorous the other day. There was a guy, <coughs> he's creating this kind of imaginary scenario. He said a man, went, a man wanted to build a rocket to go to the, to, to, he wanted to build a rocket to go to Mars. So what did he do? He first came to the Americans, and he went to NASA in Houston, and he went to the, you know, the, the finest colleges, and he said to the Americans, build me a rocket to take me to Mars. So the Americans, they worked, and they thought, and they consulted, and after 15 years, the Americans built a rocket to take the man to the Mars and bring him back. Right? Then they went to the Israelis. He said to the Israelis, bring me a rocket to take me to Mars. And the Israelis, they tossed the idea around, they brought it to the military. Within three years, the Israelis had a rocket to take the man to Mars. It didn't get him back, but it got him to Mars. And I think, I think to a certain degree, that kind of does uh, illustrate the way Israel does deal with these, with these problems. So it's, 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 it's this ability to find solutions and the country's uncanny resilience that gives me my optimism about the country's future. Now, when I say this around the Shabbat table at home with my kids, right, in light of Iran, in light of Syria, in light of Hezbollah, in light of Hamas, Gaza, the government, the government's problems, the corruption, our problems with the U.S., with the Obama administration. My kid will look at me and say, Abba, Dad, you're not an optimist. You're a moron. What is there really to be optimistic about? Well, with all of that that you've just spelled out and all the domestic problems that Israel faces like every other country in the world, right? You have domestic violence. You have drunken drivers. You have corruption, right? Uh, what is there really to be optimistic about? And believe me, it's all there. Right? It's all there, the domestic violence and the drunkenness and everything else. It's all there. But it's not all that there is. That's all that we hear about. That's all that you hear about in Norway. Right? I mean, when you read about Israel or you hear about Israel, you're not hearing about anything good. You're only hearing about the problems, and the problems exist. But that's not all that there is. Right? That's all that you read about. That's all that the journalist I write about. But that's not all that there is. There's a vibrant, pulsating life in Israel. There's an incredible energy there in every single sphere, artistic, intellectual, religious, and even now, believe it or not, athletic, right? Israel has its first player in the NBA. There are strong, dedicated, incredibly plucky people who put up with quite a bit and are much more committed to the country than, like I said, we give them credit for. There's a strong economy that has done a lot better than most economies in coming out of the global, the global crisis, right? Terrorism, as I said, has been, for the most part, part brought to the heel. Uh, there's a standard of living in Israel. We were just accepted into the OECD, right? There's a standard of living right now in Israel that was unheard of when I moved there 27 years ago. When I first moved to Israel 27 years ago, it took a year and a half to get a phone hooked up into your house, right? Today you walk the street and every four-year-old kid is walking around with a cell phone, right? The sky is not falling. Things are not as bad as we often think. Then why do we think it is so bad? Now I'm going to speak 
about why Israelis think it's so bad. First of all, because that's who we are as Jews. We are a hypercritical people of others and of ourselves, right? It might be something that's in our DNA, right? The Jews, if you, if you read the Bible, the Jews complained bitterly against Moses when he brought them out of Egypt, right? If the Jews complained bitterly against Moses for 40 years, we're not going to complain against Bibi Netanyahu. That's part of who we are. That's part of our makeup. Secondly, we expect much, much more of ourselves. And I think that in the end, this is a very positive thing. We always hope for something better, and we expect something better. Thirdly, because we in Israel are addicted to action. We're addicted to drama. We're addicted to crisis. We see ourselves, I say this humbly, but we see ourselves very much as the center of the world. And if there isn't a world-shattering news event on the radio every other day, and oftentimes there is, but if there isn't, you kind of pinch yourself and wonder, are you still alive? What's going on? How can this be? Right? And if there isn't a world-shattering news event on the news every single day, then you take a very regular event and you blow it out of proportion. You overdo it. You blow it out of proportion. We've lost our sense of proportion to a certain extent. There was a, there was a cabinet minister who's since died named Tommy Lapid, and he wrote in the pages of the Jerusalem Post about three years ago. He said, look, a water pipe explodes in Tel Aviv on a Monday. And on Tuesday, the main front page story in, Yidita, in the main newspaper, Yidiot Achronot, in big red letters, is that the country's entire sewage system is going out the window, is collapsing, right? We fret, we fret, and therefore we are. And there is a lot to fret about. I'm not minimizing that. There's a lot to be concerned about, but we need perspective. We need perspective, and that perspective is sorely lacking. Last month, we just celebrated Israel's 62nd uh, birthday, right? Yom Atzmaut, the independence of the state of Israel from, from 1948. And what's important, I think, for a country like Israel during this period, during that month when we celebrate Yom Atzmaut, because just a week before Yom Atzmaut, Independence Day, we also celebrate Holocaust Memorial Day. The importance of those two days on the calendar is it allows us to get a grip on perspective, right? Look where we were as Jews 62 years ago when the state was formed. Look where we were as Jews 65 years ago after the Holocaust. Like, and look where we are today with all the problems right, and all the challenges. It's indeed rather miraculous. I want to I close right now by, by saying some, relating something that I heard the president of uh, Yeshiva University say, a man by the name of, of Richard Joel. There's a program called Birthright. I don't know if you've heard about it. Birthright is a program that, that brings every Jewish kid to Israel. Right? The idea being that uh, a lot of these kids are not connected to Israel or to the Jewish people, and what will make them connected is to give them a sense of what Israel is like. So he was bringing a group of these kids to Israel. And again, these are kids who don't have much of a sense of Jewish history or Jewish identity or the importance of Israel. And he was bringing them to the Western Wall, right, to the Kotel, to the Western Wall in Jerusalem. And he... We wanted to fire them up. We wanted to psych them up because they didn't have an idea much of what they were going to say, wh what they were going to see. And this is what he said. He said, your great-great-grandparents and my great-great-grandparents almost certainly did not know each other. They probably came from different parts of Europe or from other lands. They spoke either different languages or dialects of the same language. They probably had different levels of education and different levels of religious observance and commitments. And they all eked out their living, perhaps, in very different ways. But he said to these kids, your great-great-grandparents and my great-great-grandparents shared two things. They all spent their lives yearning to touch the stones of the Western Wall, and they all knew that they never would. The fact that we can do that, the fact that if I find a parking space in the morning, I can go and pray at the Western Wall, right? In a land in which we, the Jews, make the decisions, the good ones and the bad ones, in which we determine our own fate for the first time in 2,000 years, in which we run our lives by the rhythm of a Jewish calendar, in which we speak to each other in Hebrew, in which we defend and protect ourselves by ourselves, this is not something to be taken for granted. It's something that we have to realize and we have to keep that in mind when we're looking at everything the, 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 the country faces. And this is something that's very important to keep in mind, even if the country oftentimes seems to be an imperfect place. Uh, thank you, and I'd be happy to take any of your questions.
questions. No questions, I'll say this in Norwegian. <laughs> yes, ma'am. I'm sorry? Yes. I think I think I think that first of all I think we in Israel lack perspective, and I also think the world lacks perspective. I mean, w when looking at Israel, the world lacks perspective, and not only the perspective of you know what has been accomplished by the country in the last 62 years, but also perspective about the very nature of the conflict. And I think that you see this quite a bit in Europe. I think because of Europe, because of the way Europe has been able to to heal the wounds that it had, you know, 65 years ago. I think they say, well, hey, if we can do it, then why can't they do it over there? And I think that the, the, what people, people tend to miss is that this is a different type of conflict. This is a different type of conflict. It's to a large extent, I think, unfortunately, it's turning into a religious conflict, which is going to make it even more difficult, more difficult to, to, to resolve. Um, I, I think, again, I, you know, if this was just a national conflict, if this was just a conflict over territory, then you trade territory and you get on with it. Okay? Now, Israel has shown that it's willing to trade the territory, but the other side hasn't been shown that it's willingness to get on with it. So I think it shows you that there's something else very much you know, deeply ingrained here. And I think a problem, and I think this is something that many Israelis, again, when I talk about the transformation of Israeli society, I think you've seen this over the last 10 years. I think many Israelis are not convinced, right, as we were, I remember when Israel celebrated its, its 50th anniversary at the, in, in 1998, we had thought that we had arrived. This was during the height of the heyday of Oslo, right? And we thought, yes, we had been accepted. They had accepted us. We were going to compromise. They were going to compromise. And we were going to live together happily forever, right? And then we got hit by the Intifada. And I think that hammered home to the Israeli mind that, no, you haven't been accepted here yet. The other side still doesn't accept your right to be here, not necessarily in, you know, in, in all the territories that were taken in 67, anywhere. Anywhere. It's not a question of boundaries. It's, it's a question of your right to be there within any parameters. And I think that, I, I don't think that the other side has, has accepted that yet. Uh, I think that they think that if they keep pushing, eventually, you know, eventually they're going to push us over or the world is going to step in and impose a solution. And I think that's, that's also a certain perspective that the world has to take when they're looking at this conflict. This isn't a conflict like other conflicts in Europe. This is something different, and I think it has to be looked at in that, in, 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 through, those, through those eyes. Because, you know, 
think that's more, I mean, that's more your job than my job. And, uh, and I, congratulate, I congratulate you on, on your willingness to take that up because that is, that is, that is a very difficult chore. Look, I, I cover diplomacy. That's, that's what I do. I cover the prime minister and I cover the foreign ministry. And one of my hobbies is actually kind of like keeping a list of who's the best for us and the worst for us in the EU, right? Which countries like us the most and which countries like us the least. And, and, and the two countries I'm, I'm fascinated the most of by are, number one, Sweden, and number two, Ireland. Uh, I, I, in my handicap, I, I think Ireland is probably the, the worst country for Israel right now in the EU, and Sweden isn't far behind. Uh, Ireland I find fascinating because I'm just reading a book on Irish history. And what's our problem with the Irish? The Irish have their own history. They have their own baggage, right? The, the Irish had their battles with the British, the Catholics against the Protestants. The Irish look at the Palestinians and say, hey, they are us. Right? They are, the Palestinians are the new Catholics, and the Jews are the Protestants, the, 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 the Brits and the Protestants. What's the problem with that analogy? The problem is the Irish were not trying to cast the, Britain, the British out of Britain. Right? And the problem is that, that, that Britain might not have had any claim on Ireland, but you know what? Israel does have a claim on Israel that goes back 3,000 years. You know, we, might be able, we might be willing to compromise on that. Right? in order to get peace. But you can't deny the very existence of that claim. We are not the French in Algeria. Right? Jerusalem does mean something to us. Bethel does mean something to us. Hebron does mean something to us. Again, you might compromise on it, but you have to acknowledge that it's there. The problem you see right now with the Palestinians, they don't even acknowledge your claim to it. Right? Yasser Arafat said there was no Temple Mount. How am I supposed to deal with that? How, would I, how do I deal with that? How can you make peace or, want to or, or uh, being able to compromise with somebody who doesn't fundamentally accept your right to be there at all? That's the problem. How do you get the Europeans to understand that? Good luck. <laughs> yes, ma'am. First of all, thank you. And I also want to thank you because uh, it is extremely, I, I can't stress the importance it is to have voices like yours out there in places like Norway and in Europe. Because if, if, if your voices are not heard, then the, the other side has the complete run of the field. And, uh, and I know it's difficult, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's easy for me. I'm speaking to the converted, right? Uh, but, I mean, for you to stand up in, in, in a society in which this isn't necessarily the politically correct message and say that message, I think that takes a lot of courage, and I think it also takes a lot of stamina, and I think it's extremely important, and, uh, and more power to you. Um, I think that w w one thing I found, find interesting about, about, about Israeli society, and I, w w somebody at, the, at my paper wrote an article today talking about all the threats, the missile threats that now we have in Lebanon, and how it, you know, we have the civil defense drill, and how it's like it's incredible what's arrayed against us. And I think what we forget oftentimes, and we saw this in Gaza too, before the Gaza war, Right? We frightened ourselves to the extreme about what it would be like to go back into Gaza. Right? There were stories after stories about what was awaiting us, what was awaiting our soldiers. We had night nightmares about what would happen. Right? We sometimes forget that it's just as they are preparing, we're also preparing. Right? It's not as if they're building up and we're sitting on our hands. They're planning and we're doing nothing. They're planning and we're also planning. And we're not too bad at it. 
And I think that's, that, that's something that's, that's important to keep in mind. There's another thing that I think that we as Jews have to keep in mind. Oftentimes we see ourselves or others see us as well as either all powerful or completely powerless. All powerful, where do you see that? When you see people saying, well, what's Israel going to do against Iran? Right? As if it's only, you know, it's, it's, it's all our responsibility and it's all on our shoulders to deal with Iran. That's the Jew in the all powerful mode. What's the, all, the powerless mode? It's like, like when, 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 when Barack Obama says that, you know, you have to stop building in Jerusalem and you think, well, okay, the President of the United States says you have to do it, you have to do it, right? But you don't. Because we're not completely powerless. We do control to a certain degree our destiny. So I think that there's a, there's a middle ground here. And I think that's also important for us.